Good morning. <coughs> Good morning. Let's, um, so I need to uh, finish up a little bit on the slides from Monday, because um, there are some important concepts there that I didn't quite get to. And then we'll move into the slides for today. So uh, again, we're talking about randomized clinical trials or field trials in which we randomly assign individuals to one exposure group or the other. So we control what exposure group people are in. And that randomization process is the key uh, distinguishing feature of such studies. Uh, and a frequent question that, that people designing studies frequently come to an epidemiologist or biostatistician with are, how big does my study need to be? Um, and they are typically, and you can, you can actually go to the web and find all kinds of sample size calculation packages. The problem is that in order to answer the question, how big does a study need to be, you need to answer a number of questions. And that typically frustrates people a great deal. Um, but, but no one can tell you how big a study needs to be until you answer certain questions. One of the most important ones is how many interventions will you test? Um, another is what's the expected rate of the study outcome in the untreated group? And then a third particularly important one is how big of a reduction do you expect uh, or want to be able to find with your intervention? Uh, a 90% reduction, a 50% reduction, a 10% reduction. And it won't surprise you to know that finding smaller differences between groups requires a larger sample size. It may be important to you to find small differences. If it is, that means you need a larger sample size. Um, another issue in terms of coming up with sample size calculations is the study outcome dichotomous. Uh, dichotomous <clears throat> basically means you're in one of two categories, such as lived or died, cured or not cured, uh, things of that kind, um, or categorical or continuous. So blood pressure is a continuous variable, for example. And in general, if the outcome is dichotomous, you need a larger sample size than if you are simply looking at a difference in the means of a continuous variable. Um, <clears throat> the relative size of the various exposure groups, so you can have equal numbers in the different groups, or there might be reasons why you have more in one group than the other. And then you need to stipulate the power and level of statistical significance you're interested in, and whether you have any subgroup analyses that you plan to do. So for example, are you interested in looking at men separately from women, or one age group versus another age group. If that's the case, typically the sample size needs to be bigger. So until you can answer all of these questions, nobody can help you figure out the sample size for your study. And that tends to frustrate people. <clears throat> so again, I've already said this, larger sample sizes are needed to find lower levels of efficacy or smaller differences in the rate of the outcome between the exposed and unexposed groups. So <clears throat> a study has to be bigger to find a lower efficacy. You might be interested in knowing whether a vaccine is 20% effective or not. That might be really important. But if you really want to know whether it's 20% effective, that will take a much bigger study than finding whether a vaccine is 90% effective or not because of the expected differences in the rate of the outcomes in the two groups. And this just gives you an example. Of this, these are out of from a book rather than from a computer program. But it basically shows you that uh, if this is the, um, this basically is what sample size would you need to compare the proportion in two groups. Uh, and so this is the proportion of something in the control group, the proportion in the intervention group. So in other words, uh, what's the, the risk, if you will, in the control group versus the intervention group. And here you can see as that difference gets bigger and bigger, so 60% instead of 20% requires a sample size of 50. 60% versus 50% requires a sample size of 850. Okay? So it really matters how big of a difference you're trying to find. And this shows this graphically. This is what's called a power curve. Um, and so this is a total sample size of 200 people in a study and basically showing that for a bigger difference between the two groups, you have much greater statistical power to find 
a difference. Okay, so there are different ways of looking at this, the power of a study, uh, but, but, or the, what sample size do you need, but these are all intimately interrelated to each other. And so when people come and ask you, well, what, 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 are, what alpha and beta do you want? Uh, these are two important characteristics of a study. The alpha, that's not an alpha, but it's the best I could do on my computer, is the level of statistical significance, and it's the probability of committing a type 1 error. In other words, rejecting the null hypothesis when the hypothesis is actually true. The alpha is typically set in many studies at 0.05 meaning that 5% is the maximum chance of falsely rejecting the null hypothesis. So when you go to a statistician and ask how big does my study need to be, the first th one of the things she'll ask you is, well, what alpha do you want? Uh, do, you want it at point, do you want it at 0.05 or at some other level? Another question she'll ask you is, what power do you want? And the power is the probability of committing a type 2 error, failing to reject the null hypothesis when it's actually false. And the power can be set at 0.1 or 0.2. Um, these are frequently used values. Uh, but, but you can set any power you want. But the more power you want for your study, the bigger the sample size. And sample size ends up being a major determinant of the cost of a study. Now, another question in designing studies, we've talked about this a little bit, is who, is, who knows who's in what, which group? Okay, and so again, I've said that ophthalmologists don't like the concept of blinding people, but, but single blind means the study subjects are not aware of which intervention he or she receives. Double blind means the study subjects and the investigators are unaware of which intervention each participant receives. Triple blind refers to the study subjects, the investigators, and the data safety monitoring committee are all unaware of which intervention each person receives. That information is obviously captured but it's kept a secret from these groups, okay? And then when it comes time, you analyze the data, not knowing who is the placebo group, who's the active ingredient group, and then once you've done the analyses, you break the, the, the code and you look to see which group is which. And the purpose of this is to prevent or reduce bias, and this is particularly important when the outcomes are mild or subjective, such as a behavior or a level of pain that are very, very subjective in nature as opposed to something like do you get measles or not or do you get HIV infection or not. So this would be an example where that would be very important. Uh, here's a randomized controlled trial of whether St. John's wort uh, helps children uh, who have ADHD. Uh, and you can imagine that the symptoms, if you have a child with ADHD or know anything about uh, attention deficit disorder, uh, I have a child with that, uh, you'll know uh, that there could be a great deal of subjectivity in what parents report about how a child is doing. So if you, you and the child know whether you're in the active ingredient group or the placebo group, it could easily influence your reporting of the outcomes we're interested in. Right? Yeah, sure. So in a triple-blinded study, there, there is there clearly, as I've said, the information w is recorded secretly. And so it is, there obviously is a way at the end to break the blinding and determine who is in which group, but it's not done until after the analysis has been done. Or if there's a data safety monitoring committee which is taking periodic peaks at the data to see whether a study needs to be stopped early, uh, when they take a peek at the data, if they determine a study needs to be stopped early, obviously at that point they would also break the blinding to know which group is having uh, benefit and which is not. Um, so uh, this is a very important issue in terms of how randomized trials are analyzed. There are two types of analyses and you will be unhappy with both of them. Okay? Uh, one is referred to as the intention to treat and the other is on protocol. So when we randomize people to one treatment group or another, what happens if they don't receive the treatment they're expected to receive? What happens if they don't take the treatment they've been given? So people may not comply with the protocol. Uh, people may go out and take medications that they weren't allocated in the study. And so an intention to treat analysis is where participants are included in the exposure group to which they were randomized 
regardless of whether they received or complied with the treatment. So I randomize you to get the vaccine, but for some reason you don't get it. You are still treated in this trial, in the analysis, as having received the intervention. And obviously that makes people unhappy because it's clearly no longer lo really looking, if you will, at the biological effect of the intervention. So you might ask, why would anyone in their right mind do that? If we know that you didn't actually take what you were randomized to get, why would we still analyze you as though you had? And the problem is, if you do an on-protocol analysis in which participants are included in the exposure group of reflecting their actual exposure, we basically no longer have a randomized study, right? So you have elected or for some reason not done what you were supposed to do. You've not gotten the drug or the vaccine you were supposed to get. And that's a non-random process. So we, in essence, we've, we've abolished the randomization, which is the whole basis, the whole difference between randomized trials and observational studies. So typically in many studies, people analyze the data both ways. They do an intention to treat analysis and a non-protocol analysis, and then take a look at how much of a difference it makes. But you will see referral reference to intention to treat and on protocol analyses, and that's what it's all about. Okay, so the intention to treat analysis retains the randomization. It prevents the introduction of confounding, which we're going to talk about in a few weeks, but it clearly underestimates the true biological effect of the treatment. So it makes the treatment look worse than it really is. Okay? The on-protocol analysis provides a better sense of the biological effect of the treatment, but it negates the randomization and very likely introduces uh, confounding. And that's just life. You, can, you know, if, as virtually every study, there are some people who, for whatever reason, don't end up doing what they're supposed to do, getting what they're supposed to get. And in essence, you really only have two ways of dealing with the data. Okay. So um, let me now move on to, I want to now take you through some examples of important randomized trials that you should be familiar with that illustrate some of these points. Oops. That's not right. OK, so again, basically what we're talking about here are study. Yeah. So in general, power and sample size calculations do not do anything to take into account uh, uh, people not being, uh, following the protocol correctly or things of that kind. So if you will, sample size calculations tell you what you need, assuming everything goes perfectly. So, you might make a bigger study. so for example, if you expect a fair bit of dropout, if you expect to lose people to follow up, typically you would increase the sample size to take that into account. Okay? And there are, all, there are all kinds of other things where you might increase the sample size in order to take that into account. That you, what, what sample size do you want at the end for your analysis? Yes. So the question is, if people aren't really following the protocol, isn't that a more realistic a reflection of what might happen in the real world, the effectiveness of something rather than what we call the efficacy. So that's a distinction you might want to keep in mind, although most people don't. Efficacy is the effect of an intervention in the, in the ideal setting of a randomized trial. Effectiveness is the impact in the real world, if you will, when it's being given however normally it's given. And you could answer yes, that is in, might be a better reflection of what will happen outside of a randomized control trial. Okay. Okay. So again, this is basically what we're talking about in the typical randomized trial. We take individuals who might be eligible. Uh, once we screen them and determine they are eligible, whatever those criteria are, we randomize them to the treatment group, to a non-treatment or placebo group. We follow them over time and we calculate something like cumulative incidence or incidence density or hazard rates in the two groups. We've already said you can subtract the rate or the risk from one, in one from the other, or you can divide one by the other. So you can either do these absolute uh, measures of impact, or you can do 
uh, relative measures. And typically, as I'm going to show you, in randomized trials, we do relative measures, things such as relative risk, hazard ratios, uh, and, and things of the kind. So uh, as I've said, these types of studies are frequently done in clinical settings to look at whether treatment of a condition is better than some other treatment. And I'm just going to go through this, a uh, couple of these quickly. Uh, field trials then are uh, looking at prevention such as vaccines, drugs, educational interventions, environmental change. But again, in both types of studies, the unit of randomization study and analysis is the individual. You get randomized to one group or another. On Wednesday, we're going to talk about studies where I randomize groups of people rather than individuals. Those are called cluster randomized trials, and they are different in some important respects. So here's an example of a typical randomized trial in a clinical setting. Um, and here the question is, does applying leeches, is that an effective way to reduce knee pain from osteoarthritis? You might think that's a peculiar study to do in the 20th century, uh, but people uh, in the old days used leeches uh, as an effective treat, or what they thought was an effective treatment. And believe it or not, a few years ago, people decided to actually do a randomized trial where they assigned people to a 28-day course of, of a, a typical anti-inflammatory drug or a single treatment with four to six locally applied leeches. Now, is it possible to blind participants to who's in the leech group <laughs> and who's in the drug group? Probably not. Okay? So people pretty much know which group they're in, and so this raises the real possibility that how they report and how they perceive and report their pain could be very different. Right? And there's simply no way around that. Um, just an example of a study where it's not possible to blind people. So you hear these people have what's called a WOMAC score for measuring pain. Don't ask me what it is. I don't know. And here you can basically see on different days the reporting of pain by people in the leech group uh, compared to the, uh, the medication group uh, and suggesting, in fact, that at some days the, the, the people having leeches applied report less pain. So does that mean you should rush out and have leeches applied for your pain? I'll leave that up to you to decide. Okay. Um, but you can see that their conclusion was that leech therapy helps relieve symptoms in patients with osteoarthritis of the knee, and there's a knee with two, four, six leeches applied. Okay. All right. a, more, a more typical randomized trial in a clinical setting would be drug A versus drug B. Is some new drug better than an old drug? Uh, and so here would just be a very simple example for cholera. Uh, somebody's got a new drug, azithromycin, which can be given in a single dose as opposed to having to give three days of treatment with an old drug. And typically the question being asked here may not be is one better than the other, but is the new one at least as good? Is it non-inferior to the existing treatment? That's another way of designing studies and it actually changes the sample size calculation. So pretty clear, you have uh, criteria for choosing kids with that watery diarrhea and cholera in their stool. You randomly assign them to treatment A or treatment B. Uh, and then you basically look at their outcomes. And so here you can see clinical success in the two groups. And here this is actually a risk difference, not a risk ratio, and basically showing that there's no difference in these two treatments. So this one day treatment is at, is at least as good as the three-day treatment. And that might be a worthwhile thing to know uh, where you may only have access to patients for one day, uh, want to be able to give them a single uh, day of treatment, a single dose of treatment. Okay. So now uh, what I really want to focus on are the kinds of prevention trials that people in epidemiology tend to do in public health and just show you a few of these examples. Some of these are very important studies you should be at least passingly familiar with. So. This is the study done in the 1950s of the first polio vaccine. Uh, so this is the Salk, uh, Jonas Salk's vaccine given by injection in the 1950s when polio was a major problem in the United States. And here you can see uh, that, and this is, a, this is one slide capturing an, an extraordinarily complicated study, but basically they randomly assigned 400 school age, 400,000 school age children to either get the vaccine or to get a placebo. Now, why would they random, why do they have to randomly assign 400,000 children? Pardon? Because polio is a very rare disease. Even though infection with the polio virus is very common, the disease is very rare. So if you want to have enough statistical power to see if this vaccine works, you need a very large study. 
And this was a study that involved large parts of the United States. It was an extraordinarily complicated study done before there were fax machines, before there were computers, when people had to mail things, when people had to sterilize glass syringes, uh, really sort of an antiquated uh, uh, technology, uh, if you will. 200,000 kids get the vaccine, 200,000 kids get the placebo, 33 cases of paralytic polio in the vaccinated group, 110 in the non-vaccinated group. Vaccine efficacy is simply one minus the relative risk times 100%. So here you can see uh, the, uh, basically the, the, the rate for 100,000 in the vaccinated group is 16 and the placebo is 54. So one minus 16 over 54 times 100% is an efficacy of around 70% against paralytic polio. And this was the study that led to the licensure of the polio vaccine. If, in case you care, the vaccine we use today is about 96 to 97 percent effective. But this was the very first trial, and you can see that it was an enormous undertaking. Um, typically, these days, vaccine trials are much, much smaller than that. Here's an example of a more recent uh, vaccine trial. So this was the, the VaxGen Phase 3 GP120 HIV vaccine trial which was conducted in the United States. And here you can see uh, they had about 5,000 participants. So if you had to guess who was in this trial of, of an HIV vaccine in the United States. So if you were designing the trial, who would you put into a trial of an HIV vaccine? So you need people who are at high risk of HIV in order to have a plausible study size, sample size. So this was primarily in men who have sex with men, uh, but you could also do it in, in uh, injection drug users. Okay? And you'd need to screen them, find those who are not currently HIV infected. You randomly assign them to the vaccine or to a placebo. You follow them over time. You're ethically obliged to do everything you can to prevent them from getting HIV. You give them condoms. You give them health education messages. The good news and bad news is that none of those work very well, so people get infected despite all those messages. Uh, and here you can see among vaccine recipients, the risk was 0.057. The risk in placebo recipients, 0.058. The risk ratio was obviously one, and the vaccine didn't work. Yes? Isn't it about a year since they decided there was a possible cure of HIV that was taken at a time? So there are no cures for HIV, and we're not, at the moment there are no cures, but, but potential cures of HIV infection relate to use of antiretroviral drugs. Vaccines are obviously primarily intended to prevent HIV infection. And you can see, I'll just point out to you down here at the bottom, this trial cost almost $200 million. So if you say let's do lots and lots and lots of field trials, Rheingold's vaccine, so-and-so's vaccine, somebody else's vaccine, uh, HIV vaccine trials are extremely expensive. Was there a question? So this was obviously very, very disappointing, to put it mildly. My friend Don Francis, who did the trial, uh, started taking the data apart and, and, and looking to see whether there might be subgroups that seemed to have some overall benefit. Uh, and in the subgroup analysis, the implication was that the vaccine seemed to work better in non-whites than whites, i.e. blacks, Asians, and others. Uh, most people reject this sub-analysis as post hoc, after the fact, and that there's no biologically plausible reason to lump blacks and Asians together. Um, but Don was pretty desperate. <laughs> okay. Um, and here you can see this trial, actually, this was another HIV vaccine trial that actually was stopped early because the, the vaccine recipients actually had a higher rate of HIV infection than the placebo recipients. Now, more recently, there has been a trial of another HIV vaccine candidate which may have something in the range of 25 to 30 percent efficacy. It may. So there's a little more optimism now than there was when these trials were done, yes. So I have, I've sort of skipped over the part where, yes, in order, before we do a phase three trial, we have phase one and phase two studies. And so phase one studies, first of all, things are studied in animals first. Once they appear to be safe in animals, phase one trials basically look at very gross safety in healthy individuals and learn something about dosage and schedule and immune response. Phase two trials then enlarge that number and assist in the actual planning of the efficacy study. So the phase three efficacy study isn't done in general 
until a lot of earlier work is done leading up to that stage. And it's a complicated issue, but the quick answer is yes, a lot of other studies were done en route to that phase three trial. And as I've said, the most recent trial is a little more optimistic, but we still fundamentally don't know how to make an HIV vaccine. Okay, that's the bad news. Okay. Um, and this is the one uh, that, that had some more. So here you can see this is the, 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 the most recent one, uh, which showed an efficacy of 26%. It wasn't statistically significant, but it approached statistical significance. And so people are now studying uh, the people from this trial to see what they can learn about the response to the vaccine and see if they can develop a better vaccine based on, on these data, on these specimens. On the other hand, we've had good luck with HPV vaccines, as many of you know. So we now have a licensed HPV vaccine, which has gotten into the presidential election, as you may know. Uh, there's apparently a presidential candidate who believes this vaccine causes mental retardation. Um, but, but just very quickly, this was a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial of 1,100 HPV-negative women in North America and Brazil, randomly assigned to get three doses of the vaccine or the placebo and then followed for two and a little over two years. So will, does this study prove that the vaccine prevents cervical cancer? No, because cervical cancer doesn't develop until 30, 40, or 50 years after you get HPV infection. What this study shows, what all of these studies show, is that the vaccine prevents HPV infection. The studies also show that the vaccine prevents the cervical dysplasias that we think are the next step from infection en route to invasive cervical cancer. But at the moment, we don't know whether the vaccine will prevent invasive cervical cancer. It's a surmise that if it prevents infection, if it prevents dysplasia, it will, in fact, prevent cervical cancer. OK, so I want to just show you some important trials that have nothing to do with vaccines, so you're familiar with them. When I was a medical student, there was a little office in my medical school that had Mr. Fit on the door. And I had no idea what Mr. Fit was. But this is the Mr. Fit study, the multiple risk factor intervention trial. And here you can see it was to determine whether or not a preventive program that directed at the production of serum lipids, reduction of blood pressure, and reduction or elimination of smoking among men 40 to 59 at high risk of coronary heart disease uh, will result in a significant reduction in the incidence of heart attack and death from coronary disease over a six-year period. Now, I think you can probably envision some problems with this study from the get-go. Okay, so, but we'll come back to that in a minute. So fundamentally, who goes into this trial? Men, middle-aged men, middle-aged men who smoke, have high blood pressure and high cholesterol, Three factors, as we'll talk about when we talk about the Framingham Heart Study, that have been shown to be important predictors of your risk of heart disease. Okay? So these are men who are at high risk of heart disease. And it was decided it couldn't be a blinded study, and that you couldn't randomize men to no medical care whatsoever. That presumably would be unethical and completely impractical to withhold medical care from people. So they were randomized to what was called special care, or their regular care, and that's another problem, if you will, with this study. Uh, the follow-up seven years, my medical school was one of 28 institutions, and this was in the old days when $140 million was a lot of money. This was back in the 1970s. You can see a fairly expensive study, and so they ended up with 6,000 men in the special intervention group, 6,000 men in the usual care group, uh, all of whom have smoked, had high cholesterol, and high blood pressure. And just to show you what it took to get those 13,000 men, they started by screening 360,000 men, inviting 25,000 back to a second screen, um, 15,000 to a third screen, and then randomly assigning 12,800. So you can imagine the cost of screening several hundred thousand people across the country and then following them for multiple years. If you ask what was done in this special intervention, they made particularly uh, strenuous efforts to reduce their blood pressure. Smoking cessation programs, Len Simon, our faculty, is one of the architects of this study. Uh, they taught them and their wives how to cook healthy food. They brought them in for cooking classes. They gave them recipes. They did everything. They, the, the best behavioral scientists in the world 
put together this intervention designed to improve diet, uh, to get people to quit smoking, et cetera. And after seven years, here's the cardiovascular disease mortality in the usual care group, 19.3, and the special group, 17.9, the overall mortality, and basically no difference whatsoever. Okay? So, what's the problem with this study? Pardon? A lot of variables? Okay, well that's true. You might ask, for example, were they successful in getting people to quit smoking? Did they actually reduce blood pressure and did they control lipids? That would be the first thing. Were they successful at doing those things? Uh, here, by the way, are the, the, the total mortality, the cardiovascular disease mortality, no difference. Okay, uh, and in fact, they were able to show that they reduced smoking, they did control blood pressure, and they did, in fact, get reductions in lipids. One problem with this study, however, is the exact same things occurred in the usual care group. The usual care group were not in a bottle in a vacuum with no medical care. This was at a time when doctors all over the country were trying to get patients to quit smoking, control their blood pressure, everything else. So fundamentally, those things occurred at approximately equal rates between the special intervention group and the usual care group. Okay? And there was no way to avoid that. It's a free society. People can go to their doctor and get the kind of care their doctor is giving them. So uh, basically, there was really no difference in the frequency with which those things happened in the two groups. Now another issue is, maybe those things will work if you do them from childhood. Maybe doing them to people my age with high cholesterol, high blood pressure, and smoking, it's too late. Maybe the damage is done. This says nothing about whether this approach would work if introduced at the age of 20 or at the age of 10. But how long would that study take? A very, very long time, right? So uh, this was, if you will, trying to look, get an answer in people in this age group. Now, uh, but, but fundamentally, as it shows, says here, the usual care group changed their behavior on their own, and there were basically very, very small differences between the two groups. And so here you see blood pressure going down in both groups, cholesterol going down in both groups, smoking going down in both groups, et cetera. Now, it does turn out, in fact, that when you look four years later, the special intervention group and the usual care group did start to diverge in terms of their mortality rates. So the picture isn't entirely negative, but if you read about this study, after the first seven years, there was no difference. Uh, now, maybe it just takes longer for those things to have an effect than seven years. Yes. Is there a so how does mortality in these groups compare to the general population? We well, would want to know the general population of men in this age group who smoke, have high blood pressure, and high cholesterol, and the answer is I don't know. Okay. I don't know if they're any different than the usual care group here. In theory, they're no different than the usual care group here, but, but they might be different. Okay. I don't know. Okay. Now, here's another very important study you should be familiar with. So this has to do with uh, spina bifida, neural tube defects. And so for many, many years, going back to the 1940s, based on animal studies, it was suggested that it was suspected that diet influenced the risk of a woman having a baby with a neural tube defect. This was based on studies in rats, showing that vitamins reduced neural tube defects in rats when, when the, the pregnant uh, rat was, was given multivitamins, and by the fact that in general women with poor diets, poor women, had higher prevalences of neural tube defects. And so the question was, would giving folic acid prevent neural tube defects? <clears throat> so for this group, who would you choose to put in this randomized trial? Well, first of all, you need to know that a woman who's had a baby with a neural tube defect is at substantially increased risk of having another baby with a neural tube defect. So the decision was, in order to keep the sample size modest, to use high-risk women, women who'd already had a baby with a neural tube defect, and to enroll them into a randomized trial to see whether folic acid would prevent neural tube defect defects. Now this was what's called a factorial design. So there were actually four groups. One group got folic acid alone. One group got multivitamins without folic acid. One group got folic acid and multivitamins. And one group got neither. And this was intended to see whether it was really folic acid or potentially other vitamins. So was this an ethical study? 
This study, the, the, this study was not allowed by an ethical review committee in the UK when an investigator there wanted to do it, but it was allowed by IRBs and other institutions. So there clearly was controversy about whether this was an ethical study or not. Okay? But in fact, the study was approved by ethical review committees at 17 sites in the UK, Hungary, Australia, Canada, Israel, France, and the Soviet Union. So you may think it was unethical. Obviously, at least one IRB thought it was unethical. But a lot of other people thought it was an ethical study, that there was equipoise in terms of whether it's truly folic acid or not. Yes? So at that point, yes, there was little knowledge as to the effect of folic acid. Because I think now we would think it is unethical because we know that folic acid. So now we have very good evidence that folic acid prevents neural tube defects. And it clearly would be unethical to randomize women to not get folic acid. But the question is, was there equipoise at the time, or did the animal studies and the observational studies conclusively prove that it was folic acid as opposed to some other nutritional uh, nutrient, some other nutrient that was responsible? And as I've said, people clearly disagreed about that. Okay? And obviously, if you don't know, spina bifida is a very, very serious birth outcome, right? It means permanent paralysis, uh, and so it's a very, very serious birth outcome. But you can see, uh, 1,800 women were randomized, about 1,200 informative pregnancies resulted, and you have to understand these are women who are randomized before they get pregnant. The neural tube closes in the first eight weeks of pregnancy, and if you don't do this before a woman knows she's pregnant, you've lost the opportunity to prevent spina bifida. Okay? So you need to randomize women before they are pregnant, not once they are pregnant. Once they are pregnant, in essence, it's too late once they know they're pregnant. So here are the results of that study. This is the group that got folic acid and no other vitamins. Two out of 258 pregnancies had a neural tube defect. The group that got folic acid and other vitamins, three out of 256. So in the groups combined that got folic acid, 1% had a neural tube defect. The two groups combined that didn't get folic acid, 3.5%, producing a relative risk of 0.28. In other words, about a 72% reduction in the prevalence of neural tube defects in the group that got folic acid. And this factorial design also allows you to basically compare the group that got multivitamins with the group that didn't get multivitamins and to basically show that the other vitamins have no effect whatsoever. So you can do different comparisons of these groups and basically show that it's just the folic acid that matters. Okay. And this, that was the, that this is the intention to treat analysis where women are put into the group that they were randomized to, whether they got the folic acid or not. When you do a non-protocol analysis, who actually got folic acid and who didn't, you can see that in fact it's an even stronger effect, about an 83% reduction in the risk of neural tube defects. Okay, so. Uh, again, perhaps reflecting more closely what the true biological effect of folic acid really is. So this was the study that really established that folic acid is the important nutrient in preventing neural tube defects, leading eventually to the fortification of foods uh, in many countries with folic acid. And this just shows this is sort of the monitoring, and basically the study was stopped early uh, when it was clear that the folic acid was working, the Data Safety Monitoring Committee stopped the study in order to prevent additional harm uh, to, to women and their babies. Okay, so a couple more examples. This is an important study called the CARAT study, beta-carotene retinol efficacy study. Um, and so here, uh, there were many observational epidemiologic and laboratory studies suggesting that beta-carotene and vitamin A might prevent lung cancer. Why might these substances prevent lung cancer? They're because they're antioxidants, and oxidation is thought to be important in the development of cancer. And so various studies suggested that people who take a lot of vitamin A and beta carotene have a lower risk of lung cancer. But it was felt important to do a randomized controlled trial to see. So who would you randomize for a study of this? people at high risk of lung cancer, and for the most part, that's cigarette smokers. 
Now you could ask, well, does it work in non-smokers? But this study was designed to ask the question, does it work in smokers? Uh, and in uh, men with exposure to asbestos. So they took 4,000 men with occupational exposure to asbestos um, and 14,000 men and women with cigarette smoking, randomly assigned them to either get beta carotene, retinol, both vitamins, or a placebo. So again, a factorial design. They accrue a total of 73,000 person years of follow-up. And the outcome of interest is lung cancer or death from lung cancer. But since 90% or more people with lung cancer die of their lung cancer. Lung cancer is not treatable for the most part. Uh, the results are pretty comparable. And here are the results. So among all subjects, uh, lung cancer, the relative risk was 1.28. And fundamentally showing that the participants who got beta carotene and vitamin A had a 30% increased risk of lung cancer compared to people who got the placebo. So this is one of those studies where you are better off in the placebo group. And where the observational studies showing a protective effect of these antioxidants were not borne out by an extremely well done randomized controlled trial. So why might vitamin A and beta carotene increase the risk of lung cancer in smokers? Nobody has a clue. Okay, But it certainly uh, was a put a dent in the idea that you could treat smokers with vitamin A and and beta carotene and reduce their risk of lung cancer. So here you can see, sorry, here you can see the active treatment group with beta carotene and, and retinol. Here you can, uh, and, uh, and here you can see the placebo group and basically showing that the placebo group uh, did better than the treatment group. And the study was again stopped early when the, day, when the monitoring results showed the increased rate of lung cancer compared with the placebo group. Okay. Uh, so uh, th there's some really bad news here. So this is, this is a study of folic acid, but not folic acid to prevent neurotube defects, but folic acid to prevent colon cancer. But to do a, an RCT with colon cancer is the outcome. What, what do you think the problem with studying colon cancer is the outcome is in a randomized controlled trial? Why might that be a difficult study to do? Pardon? Pardon? Well, diagnosing colon cancer, that's pretty easy. You know, we know how to do that. Colonoscopy, all kinds of things. We can do that, yeah. It might take a really long time. The study might take decades. That's one problem. What's the other problem? You can't enroll people with a prior... Okay, well, I think you're on the right track. Yes? There are lots of other factors that influence colon cancer. That's why we want to do a double-blind, randomized, placebo-controlled trial to make sure those other factors are equally distributed in the folic acid group and the non-folic acid group. So that's not a problem. That's why we need a double-blind, placebo-controlled trial. Well, the other problem, yes? Uh, you need a really wide sample size. Yes? So colon cancer is relatively rare, so you need a very large sample size. You need to follow them for a long time. But there's also a question about the ethics, because we think that, that what are called adenomas precede colon cancer. And so if we're doing the ethically right thing, we'd be screening participants for their adenomas and removing those adenomas before people develop colon cancer. Okay, So there might be an ethical problem to doing the study with colon cancer as the outcome as well. So this was a study not to prevent colon cancer, but colorectal adenomas, which, as I've said, we think are a predecessor to colon cancer. And they occur, so they have to take a shorter time to develop. So you can do the study, and they're more common. So you can do a smaller study in a shorter period of time and do it ethically. And because these tend to recur, the people in the study were people who had a prior diagnosis of, a, of an adenoma. Okay. And again, observational studies had suggested that a diet rich in folic acid reduced the risk of colon cancer. So that was, if you will, the rationale for doing this study. This was another uh, study in uh, factorial design in which aspirin was also 
given. So you could get folic acid and aspirin, folic acid and no aspirin, aspirin and no folic acid, or neither. You follow people over time. And there are too many slides here, but again, uh, observational studies, a low folate diet associated with increased risk of colorectal cancer. In animal studies, folate has an anti-neoplasia effect. Low dose aspirin reduces the risk of colorectal cancer. So all of these are the reasons why the study was done. Again, a double blind study. And the bad news is, folic acid, I'm going to skip all this. The bad news basically is that for all the various outcomes, neither aspirin nor folic acid reduces the risk of adenomas of the colon. Okay? So these are, these are the relative risks. The black box is the point estimate of the relative risk. And in these various groups, whether for any adenoma or an advanced lesion, basically the study showed a relative risk no different from one. And even a slight suggestion um, that, that in fact there might be a slightly increased, although statistically not significant, increased risk in people who got folic acid. Okay? So another very disappointing study in terms of things that nutritional intake thought to protect against the cancer where the randomized trial didn't, didn't support that. Yes? So in cases where your observational studies show one thing and your um, experimental studies show something totally different, say for example, you have So, so the quick answer is typically, and this is very controversial, but in general the reason we do randomized controlled trials is we suspect that there's a problem with the observational studies and that problem is overwhelmingly something called confounding. So what do I mean by confounding? We're going to define that in a few weeks, but you won't be surprised to know that people with a diet rich in folic acid are different from people with a diet poor in folic acid in many respects, right? So it might be one of those other factors that's really responsible for the lower rate of colon cancer and not the folic acid intake itself. And so a third factor that's related both to the exposure and to the outcome is what we call a confounder, a topic we're going to come back to. So we think that in well done randomized trials we have eliminated or largely eliminated confounding that is there in the observational studies. But randomized trials are also thought to not necessarily be reflective of the general population because the people who agree to be in randomized trials tend to be different than the community in general. So you get into an argument which of these is more important, the selection bias inherent in who's in a trial versus the confounding inherent in observational studies. So I'm just going to show you one more quick example because it illustrates that point very nicely. And this has to do with, uh, with calcium and vitamin, with, with uh, postmenopausal hormones. Um, and this is a, the Women's Health Initiative was a huge study to look at the effect of diet, calcium, vitamin D, and postmenopausal hormones. And again, here, uh, observational studies suggesting postmenopausal hormone use reduces the risk of cardiovascular disease in women, but increases the risk of breast cancer. But the balance of risks and benefits in healthy postmenopausal women was uncertain. So a random, an enormous study across the U.S. was done, randomizing women. This is a tiny piece of that study, but postmenopausal women 50 to 79 with an intact uterus, randomized to one group or another. So here you can see 16,000 women randomized to get estrogen and progestin or a placebo. They're followed over time. Can't read that, obviously. So here are the data for death. The death rates are no different in the placebo group and the estrogen group. Over eight years, no difference in death rates. Can't read that either, but you can see these. Uh, and in point of fact, the estrogen group is the dotted line. The estrogen group had higher rates of coronary heart disease, stroke, pulmonary embolism, and invasive breast cancer, and lower rate of colorectal cancer and hip fracture. So postmenopausal estrogens in this randomized trial reduced the risk of hip fracture and the risk of colorectal cancer, but increased the risk of cardiovascular disease and breast cancer. Yes? Estrogen plus progestin. Estrogen plus progestin. So if you started saying, well, how do you, what's the meaning of this trial? Does this extend to other hormone formulations? Maybe not. Would this be true if we started women at age 30 instead of age 55? Maybe not. 
right? So to whom can you extrapolate these results? A very, very contentious issue. But another example where the observational studies show one thing with regard to heart disease, and the randomized control trial shows something different. So people find this very, very perplexing and difficult uh, because it raises the question of what if you can't do a randomized control trial of something? What if you only have observational data showing a protective effect? Can you believe the observational data and make recommendations to people based on observational data uh, if you don't have a randomized trial. And so that really raises some very profound problems. Yes, question up here. OK, so this is simply to illustrate these are some very important randomized clinical trials. There are hundreds and thousands and thousands of clinical trials. But the point is um, that we do randomized trials when we are uncertain about the the, the benefits and risks of some intervention. We have equipoise, um, and we think there's an important question to be answered. Okay? And they obviously only work when we have something that is potentially beneficial, and sometimes we're right, and sometimes we're not right. So on Wednesday, we're going to talk about the same approach, but not randomizing individuals, but randomizing clusters or groups of individuals which is a very, very common type of study done in public health, okay? <clears throat>